a little coughing fit just as I hit the record button. All right. This is a request. I have a blanket on. I'm a little chilly. I'm a little cold. I'm still getting over it. Well, I'm, I'm over my flu, but it's just chilly. Um, this is a request by, jeez, uh, four or five people. I apologize. This is Khalid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the name White because that's what I am. Khalid uh, Ibn Walid. Walid. I've heard it said before, but the only thing that stuck was, uh, I said Khalid, Khalid, Khalid. That's the only thing that stuck. Um, I saw that this was, it looked like a college uh, professor talking about it. So this is 84 minutes, I'm gonna break it down. 17 minutes. I can bring down five 17 minute videos, so. I have my little cough button, and um, let's get into it. This was heavily requested because um, people found out, and I found out that I, I apparently have quite the man crush on this guy. Not the prof, not the professor. This guy. So let's get, let's get into it. Okay. Uh, all right. So that was the territory that the Muslim expansion. I'm guessing had conquered at the at the the height of everything let me uh sorry probably should have done this before but we'll do it now and go the talk tonight is going to be about a specific person which is unusual for austin school lectures usually i do some like overwhelmingly large event that's unwieldy um in this case the person is named khalid ibn walid uh, he was a 7th century Arab. He was actually born probably sometime around. He said the name so good. I don't even know what he, how he said that. It's amazing. On uh, 592. So, end of the 6th century, but most of his life is in the 7th century. 592, okay. And experiences taught me, and for those of you who've had me before, <laughs> that I should never start my stories at the beginning. I need to start my stories way before the beginning. So, mm, okay. so that's what I'm gonna do. And that's in part because I wanna make sure that I ground him firmly in the period that he's in. Like I, I wanna make sure that there's a, a good understanding of why what he does is so interesting and uh, also just sort of a sense of why it matters. Um, Fair. I'm going to start also by making a completely subjective statement that when it gets on the Austin School YouTube channel, will draw a bunch of ire, oh. and I'll probably get a stream of nasty comments. But I like that. So, uh, and it is this, that Khalid ibn Walid was one of the three greatest warriors of all time. And that's... One of the three greatest warriors of all time. I can't say he's wrong. I, I, I would like to know who his uh, other two are. So then I could, you know. Let me see. These are the, the warriors that I can think of. Obviously... Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan, however you say his name, Alexander the Great, Khalid, I put Hannibal on that list, Caesar was good. And I'm just trying to think of people who just dominated. I don't, I don't put Napoleon on there so much because I'm I'm thinking more guys who fought with swords, um, you know, old school fighting. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, I, I mean, I can name some people, but Caesar did lose. Hannibal lost. Hannibal lost an eye. But then again, so did Thor. And he's the god of thunder. So, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I that's one of the reasons why I want to cover him is because I just want to do a profile in a person who, uh, if, if you're interested in warfare, it totally embodied warfare. Yes, so he did. This is a talk about war. And, and I'll probably also get a little bit of flack for over-glorifying war. I just want to add, learning about him, I learned that he was someone who, I mean, not only was he just good at what he did, he he never abused his power he shared whatever he had with his men sorry he shared whatever he had with his men you know spoils plunder whatever but he also used that money on the people that he had just conquered or, or you know and he, he always, he kind of won him over that way because he was like, hey, look, I'm the new ruler. You know, we're the new rulers here. And here you go. Have a good life. Just continue to do what we tell you to do in terms of, you know, live your life like this. And you'll never pay tribute and you'll never hear from us again. I mean... I can't think of any one else that might have done that. Alexander the Great, <clears throat> you know, he he conquered, but he conquered for his men. Um, Genghis Khan, I I just don't know enough about him. Um, but I have to believe he probably didn't care so much about the people he defeated. Hannibal was kind of the same way. In, in terms of he did I don't I don't I, I don't know if he was as generous though I don't know I'm sorry I'm taking up a lot of time here which is cool too I'm okay with that as well um, when I, for the record when I was at the University of Maryland University College in their history department we were trying to create a war history department so this is part of my mental illness um, so having said all this I want to start by actually attacking the way history is taught in the United States. <laughs> and uh, the reason is, is because of the way we structure Western Civilization courses. So if you take Western Civ 1 and Western Civ 2, the general idea, and most of the textbooks are set up this way, is that Western Civ 1 will cover everything till 14 92 or 1648, whatever arbitrary year they picked to stop Western Civ 1. And then Western Civ 2 will be everything since 1648. So in other words, we're going to spend 16 weeks talking about the first 5,000 years of Western civilization. And then we're going to spend 16 weeks talking about the last 350, which is based on two really big flaws. The first is sort of a proximity bias. Because the last 350 years are closer to us, they therefore must be more important. It's also kind of when the country got founded and stuff like that, so I would see why they would focus more on that than they would the before time. You know, that's... I, I barely learned much outside... I barely learned about World War One. I've learned more watching these videos. World War One is taught, and I think it's only taught because it's taught from the American aspect of the sexy part of, oh, America came in and saved. And, and it's like, mm -mm. there was a lot going on. But, yeah, we're, at least me, well, I'm sure I wasn't alone. We're, we're just, we're taught more American history compared to uh, the world is taught world which 
is definitely wrong. For example, the outcome of the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, I guarantee you, has way more impact on your day-to-day -day lives than uh, the outcome of the British, one of the British defeats, <laughs> there were multiple, in Afghanistan in the 19th century. But the defeat in Afghanistan in the 19th century, was it in the last 200 years? There were, the British have been beaten four times, two times in the 19th century. Um, and so it's closer to you, but it has a much smaller impact than that event 2,000 years ago, the Battle of Actium. And so for, the first problem is this bias is wrong. The second problem with this bias is its racist implications. It is a profoundly racist bias because what it attempts to do is distill Western civilization into a history of how cool white people are as opposed to actually looking at Western civilization for what it was, which was not a color-based endeavor. And if anything, it was founded by brown people. So then it, it, it's sort of an attempt by French, British, and English scholars to capture something that they didn't create, make it theirs, and then divorce it from its creators. And I can prove this to you, really simply, in fact. When you take that Western Civ I class, weeks one and two cover Mesopotamia and Egypt. In fact, the, the, your class is probably structured like this. Week one was Mesopotamia, week two was Egypt. Every professor is different, every university is different, but probably weeks um, three, four, five, and six were Greece, and then maybe seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 were Rome, and then 15 was the medieval period, which is a thousand years span of time, covered in one week. <laughs> and then week 16, the first part of the modern. So if they went to 1648, they, they went to that, right, in that last week. The reason why this is rooted in, in, a, in a profound form. I was laughing at the one week covering a thousand years of medieval time. <laughs> That's pretty accurate. Of racism is because of the following. The class admits that Western civilization was created by Iraqis and Egyptians. It starts in Mesopotamia and Egypt. It okay. admits that. Okay. And then, it, and then it pretends that Western civilization got up and ran away and began inhabiting Italy and Germany and England and never again ended up in the Middle East. Kind of like it it went, it left there, went over here, and just thought, well, let's start fresh. Well, you're, you're starting fresh with ideas that you came from, and you're transferring those over, whether you, you know it or not. Now, you may not have liked everything that you got over here, but that is the basis, that's the foundation of how you're gonna springboard forward and, and up to a civilization. You may ch tweak things here and there that you think are better fit that maybe just don't work as well or whatever, but it's still the same bedrock. You're still building off that, you're still building the same foundation. So I understand exactly what he's saying there. It's true. Which is for pop um, Prime example, a lot of America is, is uh, the foundations are ancient Rome. We use a lot of that in how we built up our society here. Preposterous, because all the Middle East could ever do as the founder of Western civilization is simply evolve its Western civilization. Do you see what I'm saying? It, it's not like it could lose it. It is it, it just evolved differently than Italy or Germany or England, yep. but it doesn't make it any less Western Civ. Mm -hmm. And so the way we teach Western Civ one, where we do one week, maybe, maybe two weeks on the medieval period, actually takes this to the next level. Because I'm going to talk about an event that takes place in that. We act as if the medieval period, which we call the Dark Ages, only took place in Europe and in fact, we've renamed the birthplace of Western civilization, the Middle East, 
as if it's in the east, when it's clearly not in the east since it birthed Western civilization, right? <laughs> and then we ignore everything that was happening in the Middle East during the medieval period. And let me just give you an idea of what was happening in the Middle East during the medieval period. So while Europeans had no indoor plumbing and no paved roads, and their life expectancy was 40, and the way they took care of their waste was they would do it in a chamber pot and fling it into the street, the Middle East had indoor plumbing that brought fresh water in and took sewage water out. The Middle East had streets that were lit up at night with oil lamps, in part because I want to set the mood, show you the technology that was available at the time, and then sh tell you why what follows follows. It's the Battle of Karhai. Panicked for a second. I was like, what? I, I want to hear this. I'm it's liking this guy. It's the Battle of Karhai. Uh, I didn't actually... Try, so, I pulled up this map. I was having the hardest time finding a map. I was at the point where I was going to make a map, but I was running out of time. And then I thought, you know what? I got to find something. And I kept digging and digging and digging in the Googles. And I, and I believe this is a po uh, the man who made this map is Polish. Uh, if you're not Polish, I'm so sorry. I just guessed. Um, but it's OK, because most of the names are in either the Persian names or the Roman name. Uh, if I'm wrong, forgive me. But it's somewhere right in there. So what is today? The southern end of Turkey, a little bit to the east just north of Syria. <clears throat> the reason that battle took place is because of what a guy named Gaius Julius Kaiser did. Uh, you guys incorrectly call him Julius Caesar. Okay. S Caesar, I'm going to do it too, because it's fun. Who doesn't like to mispronounce things on purpose? Caesar decided his family was going bankrupt that the best way that he could solve the bankruptcy was to start an illegal war with the Celts living in Gaul, conquer them, and then plunder their resources and enslave them. And so that's what he does. And he becomes fabulously wealthy, and he saves his family from bankruptcy. He was part of a secret illegal arrangement with two other men. The three men were in the Senate. There were two patricians and a plebeian. The Senate always wanted a plebeian on board, and the plebeian, of course, was Pompey Magnus, the most famous plebeian to be in the Senate. And then Caesar, who was a patrician, and another guy named Crassus. Nobody ever remembers Crassus. Crass I was about to say I didn't remember the third one. <laughs> Crassus and Pompey hated each other's guts, and there was a little bit of fear that maybe a civil war would break out. So to prevent the civil war, Crassus, Pompey, and Caesar got together and created this secret little power arrangement so that they could control the Senate, and then basically the three of them would rule Rome, and everybody would pretend somebody else was doing it. Isn't that cool? Crassus if you can get away with it. Sees what Caesar does, sees how wealthy Caesar becomes, and goes, Wow, I want this. Crassus was the governor of Syria. So he thought. Who's the nearest rich, what's the nearest rich place I can go conquer? And he went, it's Persia, let me attack it. And so he took uh, 40,000 Romans and they marched from Syria into the Persian Empire and they met at Karhai. 40,000 Romans. Uh, 32,000 infantry, and they were heavy infantry, right? Think of Roman legionnaires with the interlocking shields and the spears called pilum, and they had a little gladius, a little, a little short sword, and they would march in tight ranks, heavily armored. They were basically just a giant human wall, pointy human wall, because they had the spears sticking out. And then uh, about 4,000 light cavalry and about 4,000 medium cavalry, and they went. And they, they meet the Persians at Karhai. They meet 8,000 Persians on horseback, 8,000 infantry, uh, cavalry, and which is what they had. They had 8,000 cavalry. And the Persians that they met were light cavalry with 
bows and arrows. So the Romans are like, oh, we got this. 40,000 versus 8,000, what are they going to do? Shoot arrows at us? So the This is that battle. Nope. I want to say this is the battle where they, they just, they like were sniping at them with the arrows and then just wiped them all out. But I could be thinking that that's what they did to Caesar's group because this isn't Caesar. Sorry. Persians ride up <clears throat> and they fire arrows from horseback. And the Romans were like, okay, testudo. Testudo is where you take the shields, they interlocked. You could, you could connect them together. That wasn't Persians. Um, what I'm thinking of was the, uh, I think they were African. And now I'm not thinking of Caesar. Now I'm thinking of the Muslim expansion series. Damn. Now I don't know where, where what I'm thinking of. I'm wrong. And so they locked them together this way. And then the row behind them held the oh, shields stopped. up like this. And then the row behind them held their shields up so that they interlocked to make a roof and a wall. And the Persian arrows bounce harmlessly off the top. Just, it probably sounded loud, but otherwise nobody's injured. And so at this point, the Romans are chuckling. They're like, what are you going to do? Just keep doing that? You'll run out of arrows eventually. And so then the Romans march forward slowly. And then Persians turn around and fire another round of, of arrows at the Romans. And then they ride off. So now the Romans think, OK, well, let's chase them. So they go out of Testudo because you can't run like this. You can't run holding a fort near. You need to lower your shields. So they lower their shields and they take off on foot running. And they're chasing the 8,000 Persian horse archers. The Persian horse archers turn around in their saddles and fire backwards. Nobody had ever done that in battle. The Romans are shocked. They're so surprised by the thing, they don't have time to pull up Testudo and hundreds of Romans go down. This rattles the Romans. They're like, whoa, we can't just chase these guys. Okay, we need to be a little more cautious. And the Persians start running up a hill. So now the Romans are slowly following after them. And the Persians turn around and shoot, but because the Romans have slowed down, they go back into Testudo and not many are injured. They don't quite get into Testudo in time, so some of them do get injured. And so it slows the Romans down. They're getting a little nervous about all of this. But then the Persians go over the top of the hill. So now the Romans are like, well, we might as well run. They can't shoot through the hill. So they start running and they run up the hill. And just as they're cresting the hill, to their shock and dismay, the Romans see 1,000 cataphracts. Cataphracts were fully armored soldiers on top of armored horses. Oh. The first time Europeans will do that, put a fully armored man on top of an armored horse, is 14 centuries later. At wow. the end of medieval Europe, the Persians were technologically 14 centuries ahead of any European society in terms of heavy cavalry. 1,000 cataphracts was far superior to... What was the influence for them to... I mean, it had to have... Well, I shouldn't say it had to have been done to them to know to do it, but maybe they'd been in enough horse battles to know that they need to protect their horses just as much as their people. I wonder who came up with that. How much time it would take to craft the metal or steel or whatever to fit, and you know each pe and and how to link them together on the horse's legs, and so much time. Eight thousand Roman cavalry, <clears throat> because they were they were tanks. There was mm -hmm. almost nothing you could do to them, and they're charging up the hill as the Romans are charging down the hill. So the Romans charging down the hill are trying to stop, and they're shouting to the guys behind them, "Hey, stop running!" But the oh, guys no. behind them can't really hear them, in part because they're some of them are on the other side of the hill, but in part because of all the noise. And the guys running down the hill can't stop running because if they do, they'll get knocked down and trampled to death. And so they're forced to run towards these 
cavalry units, they can't get into formation, and the cataphracts cut through them like a hot knife through butter. It's a catastrophe. Romans are dying everywhere. The cataphracts get to the top of the hill, they turn around and come back through. They get to the bottom of the hill, they turn around and come back through. The Romans are doing everything they can to try to create order and get back into combat formation, and they can't do it. Eventually, Crassus' son, who is up on the hill, gets identified by one of the Persian warriors. They kill him, cut off his head, stick it on a spike and jam it into the ground so that his dad can see his head. The Romans are completely disheartened. Crassus comes up with a new strategy because while the cataphracts are going up and down the hill, the horse archers return and they're just shooting arrows at the <laughs> Romans who can't get into formation, let alone go into Testudo. And so the Romans are getting hammered by arrows and cut to pieces by these heavy cavalry men. And so he decides, you know what we'll do? We'll just fight this until the Persians run out of arrows. It's always a bad day when your goal is to get the other side to run out of ammo because they're shooting at you. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? It's also a really bad day when the Persians brought 1,000 camels loaded with 1,000 arrows each. They had a million arrows. And as the Persian horse archers are firing their arrows, the camels just ride up to them and hand them more. <laughs> For all intents and purposes, a million arrows versus 40,000 men, like the Persians had an unlimited supply of ammo. Crassus' strategy is a disaster. And the only thing that could have made that worse, oh, I got a in the video here only thing that could have made that worse is if the camels themselves had the like bazookas on the hump and they could fire it themselves that's the only thing that would have made it worse because so far this is a disaster this is a, this is a brutal disaster wow wow well i'm going to end this here and then i'm going to I'm going to grab some food and then I'm going to jump right back into it because I got to figure out how else. I'm glad he did it this way to where he went backwards because this is extremely interesting. But it also lets you know that there were so many ways that they fought. Oh, well. I'm going to end this here. This is awesome. Uh, like and subscribe. Or... Um, You'll have to, I'll make an entire video just of me putting on pantyhose and you'll have to watch it. Mm-hmm. Figure that one out.